Welcome everyone. Thank you for making this evening's webinar. I hope you find it to be enjoyable. We'll be taking questions offline in the interest of respecting everyone's time. Uh, let's get started here. So uh, you can see the title slide here, Aussie expats, how will your Aussie property be taxed now that you're a US resident? Uh, this is specifically not financial advice. I am not instructing anyone to buy or sell based on the information they get here tonight. We are privileged to have the relationship of some excellent tax attorneys and CPAs. I would suggest you consult with them on your individual situation. All right, a little bit about me. So I'm a tri-citizen. I was born in the UK, raised in Brisbane, Australia, moved to the United States in 20, uh, 2005 it was. Uh, I worked for a short while in corporate finance and investment banking and have been a financial advisor since 2010. I, uh, I, I founded my firm in 2013 in California before moving out here with my wife uh, in 2014 to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we now live. Uh, let me see. Uh, I've been a member of the Australian Financial Planning Association and my firm is the only US registered investment advisor specifically serving the Aussie expat community. We do not have an Australian financial services license. We partner with firms that are able to help Aussie expats in Australia. Uh, I also was, uh, just one other detail, also was a uh, professor uh, in the CFP, the Certified Financial Planning Program at UC Berkeley Extension and Golden Gate. Okay, Arite Wealth Group, who are we? What are we about? We are uh, really consist of two brands, Arite Wealth Strategists and Arite Wealth Strategists Australia. We are a fee only firm. That means something very specific. That means we never take commissions under any circumstances. Unlike many other types of financial advisors, 100% of the time, we are our client's fiduciary and have been regulated as such since the inception of the Investment Advisor Act in 1940. Uh, we're a paperless firm as much as we can be and try and do things digitally because we have uh, clients all around the country and all around the world. We have an office in Minneapolis, of course, that's where I am right now, and in San Francisco. Arite Wealth Strategist Australia, would you believe we work with Aussie expats, primarily located in the US, but uh, also in Australia for qualifying wholesale clients. We've got, uh, the majority of our clients are in California, New York, uh, and interestingly, uh, in, uh, in Oregon. Arite Wealth Strategist, which is uh, the, the, the underlying brand here, we're focused on US business owners and executives. So, Aussie expats that find themselves uh, in that category as, a, as an executive or business owner are particularly well served with our expertise. Uh, he, we consider ourselves a general financial contractors in terms of all the different things that we may do to assist in an Aussie expat's financial life. Uh, and, and through my experience, I've come to really consider Aussie expats to, to be belonging to one of three categories, and that is there are those here, the working holiday uh, crowd, you might say, that are here on short-term assignments. They know they're here for a short term, they're on a particular visa, they're very interested in going back, they've got a, a date or a quarter uh, at which they know they'll be returning, uh, and, and, and that's the, the, the domicile certain crowd. Uh, the domicile uncertain crowd in, in category two here, they, like me, move to this country for a, an opportunity. Uh, maybe waiting for uh, to meet the right person or for uh, things to develop in their careers. But in any event, they might stay, they might go, they just don't know. And of course, established Aussies, those that have come here, found a partner and have decided to call it home or they love it here, they things are going great at work and they want to call the US home for the rest of their lives. Uh, we really work with the first two categories. They're the established Aussies and the longest stays. Uh, we, we partner, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, Australian financial planning firms to provide that bookended advice. So we've got someone with an Australian financial services license that can answer the technical questions in Australia. And, and, and our firm here, where we, we are uh, registered in the United States. So you can see here a table uh, I've put together describing the different advice needs of these three kinds of expats. But 
let's talk about the presentation here tonight. So first thing is we're going to just take a high level view of the factors to consider when thinking about the Australian property market. What are the pros and cons of different asset classes, stocks, bonds, and real estate generally before we dig in in detail and consider the situation for Australian non-residents, Australian citizen non-residents. Um, I did want to just one second. There was a, a note I wanted to pull up here. I, I did really want to make a point that this presentation is not a substitute. This is not a, a, a uh, anything I'm saying for compliance purposes. This is a genuine statement that that that, uh, that you should hear, and that is. This is not intended to be a substitute for speaking with a CPA or a tax attorney familiar with Australian and US cross-border matters, because the more I learn about this field, the more I've, I discover that there is very little cert certainty and that individual circumstances truly do dictate how uh, you, the direction that you may follow and how your, your assets or your superannuation or whatever may be taxed. So I just wanted to make sure that was stated. Okay, so we'll talk about general issues affecting Aussie expats, talk about mortgage issues, Australian tax issues, of course, uh, and US tax issues. So factors in the Australian property market. Here's, before we get into that, however, one thing we need to be mindful of is uh, the number one principle of financial planning for Australian American uh, expatriates. And, and that is, your long-term domicile should really determine where the bulk or all of your assets lie for so many reasons, but they really boil down to administrative and uh, the, the hassle and the volatility of foreign exchange. It's important in this presentation to be mindful of, of the definition of Australian tax residency. What does it mean to be a tax resident? Let's not... Uh, get confused between legal residency, that is, are you a citizen, are you uh, in the country on some kind of visa, and your tax residency. They are different topics altogether. So Australian tax residency, there's a, there's a website that I've got a link to here you can go to and, and determine uh, what the deal is, but basically it boils down to the what's called the resides test. I hear a bunch of uh, examples here, but the resides test is it's pretty straightforward, and that is, do you reside in Australia or not? Really that simple. And if you don't reside in Australia, you are a non-resident, even if you are an Australian citizen. So uh, an important distinction right there. One thing that underscores this entire presentation is the unaffordability of Australian real estate. It has risen up the flagpole. It has gone to, uh, the, the politicians are on it, affordability is becoming a political problem. And so uh, we're starting to see laws enacted that make it more expensive to be a non-resident property owner. Non-residents, unfortunately, are without political representation. There, there are many hundreds of thousands of Australian non-residents, and there's no member of parliament that represents uh, non-residents. So they are as uh, Saul Eslick, anyone that's read uh, any of the Australian business or finance media would attest, a regular contributor uh, who says that it seems the only property investor the government is willing to take them to make life a bit more difficult for our foreign ones. It is confining any measures designed to reduce the attractiveness of property investment to foreign investors, presumably because they don't vote, as I was just saying. All right. So let's do a quick asset class comparison. Now, you didn't sign up for a presentation to, to talk about the fundamentals of stocks or bonds. I appreciate that. And uh, I'll get through this very quickly, but I'm doing this to illustrate a point that will come through in the uh, penultimate slide. So asset class, let's talk about stocks. Stocks are liquid and divisible. That is, you can easily buy and sell them and you can sell partial bits or add more to your holdings. They are exchange traded. That is, they're cheap and easy to trade, cost you $6.95, you can do it from your uh, computer or your mobile device, and you'll have cash in your bank in settlement date plus two days. Easily diversifiable, that is, if you 
just own uh, Apple stock and you thought this is I'm taking a bit too much of a risk just owning Apple stock, especially after news today about uh, them uh, looking to get current with their $13 billion Irish tax bill, you might think I should I would do well to, uh, to not be exposed to the idiosyncratic risks of that one company. Preferred tax rate. This is for, for US tax residents. Uh, in particular, you pay 15% below, if you're below the, uh, the highest marginal rate, you're paying uh, a 15% flat rate on uh, qualified dividends. So there's, a, there's a, a, a tax advantage right there. You can take up to a $3,000 ordinary income loss and returns are derived from both capital appreciation and dividends. Now that, that seems like such a basic point but I did include that for each of the three asset classes because say unlike Bitcoin or gold or any other commodity, if you own pure gold, gold itself, I mean the, the physical asset or Bitcoin, it doesn't pay you a dividend, it doesn't pay you rent, it doesn't pay you a coupon payment. It is just capital appreciation. Okay, the cons, what are the downsides of, of stocks? Well, stocks are pretty volatile and they certainly have been a little bit more so of late. There, people people often think of them as intangible. You can't drive around to uh, to your your stock and sit on its front lawn and and appreciate the view. They're they're kind of abstract. A lot of folks find stocks difficult to understand. They want to uh, uh, figure out how to invest their portfolio or how to how do you actually analyze the attractiveness of an individual stock. Tesla is always a, a, one of my favorites that comes to mind on this, on this point. Seems like, I mean, I'm not making any prognostications, seems like a fantastic company, fantastic products, but with uh, PE ratios that, uh, that they carry, it, it's going to be many, many, many years of uh, future earnings before uh, anyone is likely to, to realistically continue to see capital appreciation on that holding doesn't mean I don't believe in the company and, and, uh, and what they're doing. Another thing US tax residents need to be mindful of is foreign custodied stock holdings. Now that's a, a mouthful, that, uh, that, that phrase right there. What I mean by foreign custody is not, not, not your, you, your US domicile, US custody asset in an Australian real estate fund or uh, in a, in a Chinese fund or in a European fund, I'm talking about the money you have in Australia that is invested in a diversified portfolio may be subject and probably is subject to passive foreign investment corporation considerations, a topic for a whole nother webinar. PFIC is what that's abbreviated to in short, and we've got a fact sheet that, uh, that you can see on our website. There's of course a picture of, uh, of a, uh, Stock trading screen. All right, so moving on here, bonds. What are the pros of bonds? Pretty secure. Of course, depends on the credit rating, predictable cash flow. Uh, we run reports where we're able to actually forecast the income that a client would receive from their holding, from dividends, from coupons, uh, from their global global portfolio. I'm very proud. Uh, my my uh, power planner is on the line tonight. Hi, Kellen. Um, very, very proud to, to tell you all that we now have software that's able to report on uh, Australian holdings. So for clients that do hold Australian uh, superannuation or uh, brokerage accounts, we can actually report on that in the one portfolio, which is uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, anyhow, so it's uh, bonds yet again, easily diversifiable, exchange traded, same deal, although there are many more bonds that are not exchange traded, you can buy them individually. Yet again, returns are derived from both capital appreciation in a declining rate environment, which, which in the US at least we're, we don't seem to be in, and coupon payments. Coupon is the word they used for interest payments with bonds. Cons. Well, sadly, it's, a, it's the inverse of the previous bullet point. In, uh, in, a, in a rising interest rate environment, that means that the price of your bonds, if you are in a fund, it's important to note, if you are in a fund, uh, is going to move inversely to uh, to the interest rate movement, thus you're going to see a price decline if you're in a fund. And why I keep repeating myself, if you're in a fund, if you own individual bonds, yes, the price may decline before the maturity date, but 
do keep in mind that if you hold to the maturity date, you get your power value back. So if you hold your nerve, it really isn't of any consequence uh, other than the opportunity cost of there now being newer, uh, newer issue bonds that are paying high interest rates. Okay, interest coupon, unlike dividends as we saw on the previous slide, are taxed at ordinary income rates. So on the whole, bonds are a far low, are likely to experience far lower uh, capital gains than either stocks or real estate. But let us move on. Um, before we get onto the specifics of real estate, I just wanted to level set expectations here. So this is the past nine years, the performance of the S&P 500, a US stock index of the largest 500 companies, uh, it has been the stellar standout performer of the developed world. It has done incredibly well, up 223% in the last nine years. Now, no professional investor or advisor would ever recommend their client be exposed just to the S&P 500. It violates principles of diversification. Uh, instead, we would suggest, of course, it depends entirely on the, uh, the situation of the client. And there are many, many factors that go into that. But if we compare instead the S&P 500 to a moderate portfolio, you can see up here, there's the VSMGX. That's a Vanguard, very low cost. To, it's about 0.15% uh, annual expense ratio. This is a moderate portfolio. It consists of 60% diversified stocks, 40% bonds. So if you held that portfolio instead closer to the average investor's return, then you'd ex have experienced something like a 74% uh, price increase, uh, excuse me, uh, total return. That includes reinvested dividends. Uh, now, if we look slightly longer, why did I go from nine years to 10 years? Because something precipitous happened between nine and 10 years ago. Had you the misfortune of investing right before uh, the global financial crisis, your returns would be somewhat less but nevertheless, you wouldn't be complaining about uh, the kind of appreciation that we're seeing here. So the S&P is up 91% since the second quarter of, uh, excuse me, April 1st, 2008 uh, to March 1st, 2018. So yet again, you're seeing some, some decent returns here. All right, real estate. Now we're gonna talk about real estate generally. Please note that point. I'm not talking about Australian real estate, I'm talking about US and Australian real estate. So what are the common pros and cons that we can talk about between the two asset, uh, between the two markets? Well, firstly, it's a tangible asset. People love that, that they can drive around there, sit on the lawn, gaze at the, the view from their property. It's tangible. Yet again, returns are derived from capital appreciation and income. However, um, a point that I love making that uh, somehow all too frequently gets missed is that if you are not, if, if your investment property is your residence and you're moving to a market that is moving in tandem and is similarly as expensive as many Amer major American cities are, then your real gain is going to be minimal or non-existent because while the price of your house has gone up, so has the house that you're moving into. There isn't a relative difference in value in that scenario I just painted at least. Okay, capital growth has been strong and, and long-term performance in both uh, the US and Australia. Do keep in mind, however, that, uh, and, and I, I don't have the graphics that I'd like to have to make this point, but the returns of real estate are obscured by leverage people very often fail to realize that what you're really looking at is your return on equity. How much did you put into the property? How much did you get back? Well, what if it had been a cash investment instead? The returns might look quite as attractive if it was all your own money. And uh, that's, that's very often the unfair comparison that's made with stocks in particular is, is very rarely do people borrow to buy stocks, but if they did, then uh, the returns would be very, very different indeed. Uh, the, another great benefit of real estate is the potential to renovate or rezone for potential capital improvement if you have the expertise uh, and time to do that. US real estate in particular uh, offers uh, great depreciation benefits. 
uh, investment real estate depreciates over a 27.5 year scale and applies also to uh, previously owned property. It's easy and common to leverage against. Very, very, very commonly you will see, and most of the time I would say, you will see people obtain some kind of financing to buy property. It's a high status investment, let's be honest. It's, it's great, uh, those I know property owners enjoy talking about their investment properties wherever it happens to be. Downsides of real estate. Okay, so let's get into this here. It's not easily diversifiable. Uh, I don't think a whole lot more needs to be said about that. Uh, transaction costs are quite significant. We'll look at that on the next page uh, with an Australian specific investment. But just in the US, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, the inspections, any other uh, maintenance that needs to be performed prior to sale, staging, of course, uh, and real estate commissions of about 6%. So if you're buying a $500,000 home or a million dollar home, that's a 30 or 60 thousand dollar expense that's going to add to the um, the 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 recovery period that that, uh, that you're likely to experience property management is also a matter uh, you got to think about uh, marketing your property uh, t choosing a tenant uh, dealing with tenant complaints anyone that's been a property owner or has uh, been a roommate or had a roommate previously might know something about that firsthand and of course, the operating costs, there's property taxes, there's insurance, there's routine maintenance. That, that is the, uh, the fridge that goes out or the, the, the water heater or, or the, the roof that needs replacing. Uh, excuse me, not the roof, that's, that's down here under, uh, under renovations and, and other major improvements. The vacancy allowances, uh, we, it would not be prudent to pr presume your property is going to be rented for 52 weeks of the year. Uh, there's marketing costs and, and time involved with that. Renovations, of course, uh, sinking fund accruals need to be made for, for renovations. And of course, property management fees, if that is applicable to your circumstance. Additional tax filing. So even if you were a US domestic real estate investor, there would still be additional filings that you'd have to make. Uh, now, the situation gets a little more complex if you're owning Australian uh, investment property. Lastly, there are liability risks. So, of course, there's the, uh, the property risk itself uh, of the, the building burning down, but that was mentioned in the previous point uh, to do with, with insurance there, but there's also liability risks. So, the slip and fall, the party at the residence where some, something uh, unforeseen happens. Uh, for, for larger property owners that, that own, a, own a, an apartment building, there's compliance with, with certain laws. Okay, now we're getting to the meat of the presentation, and I'll go through this slide very carefully, but yet again, I, I do want to uh, affirm the expertise of my tax attorney and CPA uh, professional partners. So what are the pros of Australian real estate? Well, fantastic long-term performance. Let's take a look here. Here's the latest from the Economist House Price Index. If we go back, where are we here? Um, we go back, um, oops, why am I not seeing this? Hold on a second. Oh, here we are. Okay. If we go back to 2009, let's, let's do a comparable comparison. We see that in real terms, that is real means inflation adjusted, that property prices are now 40% higher than what they were, uh, nine years ago. Um, that's, uh, that's really something. Okay, uh, if we go back 10 years, let's see what they are. Do, 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 do. Q2 2008, 37% higher. Okay, so let's see how that's trended over time. Things have gotten progressively more expensive and Australia remains, uh, so depending on the time period, a fantastic long-term performer. And if we change to nominal prices, you'll see these, these rates are significantly higher. Now, that means nominal prices does not take into consideration inflation. So uh, that's to say the house that, that mum and dad bought back in the, in the 70s. Da, 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 let's have a look here. Back in, uh, in 78, while it is 
and they paid $50,000 for it. And while it's worth many, many, many more times that, so does the tank of, uh, of fuel, so does the, uh, the phone bill, all of the, the uh, grocery cut full of food. That is the concept of inflation, of course. I, I, I don't need to, to talk about that. Okay, but my, my point here is, yes, there absolutely has been strong long-term performance. This depreciation allowance allowed for new construction, but uh, unfortunately, uh, sorry, different different page here. Uh, unfortunately, for uh, for those purchasing investor property after the first of July or renting existing property after the first of July of last year, the law now is that if for all but new construction, uh, you are no longer able to depreciate. That's a big deal unless you happen to be one of these types of entities. So maybe you could start a corporation, but if you do that, then you fall foul of other issues in the US, namely the PFIC uh, uh, issue and other accounting complications. Okay, the cons. The downside. Now, this is going to be a long list here, and uh, I, I don't, I'm not meaning to be a bear here. I just wanted to spell out the case because I've seen it time and time again with uh, my clients that uh, even very, very high functioning, uh, sophisticated clients that just have this blind love obsession with Australian real estate. I'm here to make a case uh, that we need to be fair and just, I don't want to say uh, fair and balanced, that, that has connotations, uh, but we need to be objective in how we, uh, we think about Australian real estate as an asset class. Okay, unaffordable and overvalued compared to rent and income. Let's go back to the Economist's house price index. And by the way, this isn't uh, their, the, the Economist bias statistics. This is coming from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and other national statistical offices. And yet again, everyone knows uh, everyone knows an exception that, uh, that things have appreciated more or less. These are national statistics. So what we now see, and this harkens back to my point about the uh, the bullseye on the non-residents back, Australia is now the most unaffordable real estate market in the world when compared to average incomes. The most unaffordable in the world compared to average incomes. That's higher than Hong Kong, it's higher than Canada, it's higher than New Zealand. Now granted by a hair uh, over uh, Canada, as you see there, and only recently surpassing New Zealand, but nevertheless, that is a fact. Now, unfortunately, for for Aussie expat uh, real estate investors, you're kind of in purgatory when it comes to on the rent side. So not only are rents very expensive, but the, the what this differential between incomes and rents suggests is that your the, 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 the property is extraordinarily expensive to buy compared with your, your annual income, but the rent that people can afford to pay and are paying is much less. So the yields achieved are, are not as impressive as what they might otherwise be. If, if you're seeing numbers like Canada, where not only are the property prices high, the rents are high too, that would soften the blow a little bit. But I, I just wanted to make that point. Okay, next, foreign exchange issues, volatility and cost of exchange. Let's take a look here. You'll see I've got a chart prepared. This got, it tracks back the last six months of the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. And what we see today, or yesterday, Aussie dollar closed at about just a hair under 76 uh, US cents. It's ranged throughout that time from 81, an intraday high of uh, 81.336, down to a low in uh, late December of 71. So let's say that's roughly an 8%, 6, 7, 8% uh, band of variance that the, vol that the currency is, is moving around. So that is an important point I'll come back to later, but 6, 7, 8% volatility in six months. And that is not significant, by the way, uh, when we look at the, at the longer term. Okay, so foreign exchange issues, not only is there the volatility, uh, there's the cost of exchange. And, and, and everyone other than my clients knows 
that, and I say other than my clients because we get into bank, right? But for, uh, for most everyone else out there, you have to pay a spread. That's how all of these foreign exchange companies work is they buy in a wholesale market, they sell to you, take a spread, and that's what you get. So for very large movements of currency, that can make a big, big difference. Getting the best exchange rate available is obviously uh, a way to save. Higher stamp duty for non-residents, uh, particularly for Victoria and South Australia. But let's just do a quick example here. Let's say we're talking about a million dollar property in New South Wales, and it was gonna be an investment property. You're not a first time home buyer. Uh, it is an established home. And yes, you are a foreign purchaser. Let's look at what this total transaction costs would be. So for that million dollar property, it's costing you 12% or $120,000 to buy into that in the first place. But that's New South Wales. What about Queensland? Let's take a look. 71,000, Victoria. And, and by the way, I'm not here to, I have not audited this tool. I'm not here to say that this is uh, the, the best thing that, uh, that uh, has been approved by accountants. This is a tool that I've found that uh, generally represents uh, what what kind of transaction costs you're looking at. So same deal, it's a little worse in Victoria. It's probably even worse again in South Australia. Uh, established home first, yep, okay, let's have a look. Excuse me, no, it's not, 56. They actually did just increase, this might not be updated uh, because South Australia uh, has a 7% additional stamp duty uh, on non-resident purchases. Mortgage underwriting for non-residents. Let's take a look at this. So first of all, they're not going to recognize 100% of your income, whether you're an Australian citizen or a non-Australian a, a, a non citizen. So you, you, you're already punching with one hand behind your back in trying to, uh, to qualify and potentially a higher interest rate. I, I'm not saying absolutely and Yet again, I have no vested interest in talking anyone out of this. It's simply that I've had that many clients and prospects come to me that are just obsessed with, with real estate and Australian real estate in particular. And uh, we need to be mindful of all the factors that, uh, that, that vote against it. So if you're a foreign citizen, if we come here, this is actually the number one Google link. I have no relationship with this company. Uh, it's just the number one hit and this is a banner that stays up uh, on, on many of their pages. It says, if you're a foreign citizen outside of Australia, most homes are, are loans are only gonna be available at, at interest rates of 8% or above. Okay, well, what if you're an Aussie citizen? You don't have to worry about that, but you do have to worry about uh, the recency, they say the currency of your income. Um, I, I, excuse me, I think that, that may actually mean the the country, the currency, as opposed to the recency of the income. If you're married to a foreign citizen, some lenders won't accept it. Foreign business income, only a small number of lenders will accept it. Uh, yet again, your borrowing power may be reduced for a fluctuation allowance in the, the exchange rate. Um, so th th there is some headwind you're gonna face in, uh, in getting a mortgage in Australia. That's my only point. Not impossible, but not as easy as in your home market. Australian taxes. Now, here's what we also need to be mindful of as a non-resident investor in Australian real estate. So there's the need to file your Australian tax return. If you move to the US and you don't have a business or real estate in Australia, and let's say you only had super and a, uh, an after-tax brokerage account, no need to file an Australian tax return because neither of those sources are deemed to be Australian sourced income. But if you have real estate, now you need to file in Australia and you also have uh, got to employ some pretty specialized skills uh, in the US uh, and, and many, many prospective clients and certainly those that you see out on social media do not know about this. Um, does that necessarily spell doom for them? No, it's, it's a little like speeding on Highway 101 back in Northern California where I used to live. If you're doing the speed of traffic, it's, you could still be booked for a ticket because everyone's driving 10 miles over the limit doesn't mean that it's legal. Same thing with making sure that your taxes are filed in a compliant manner. Uh, this is really the subject of 
potentially two webinars right here. This is such a big and important point to make, but the loss of long-term capital gains tax exemption. So as of 2012, for non-residents, if you were, uh, if, if, if the, your property was not a main residence, then there was no uh, ability to, to uh, take a long-term capital gains tax exemption, meaning you're paying uh, 100% of that gain at, uh, at your ordinary rates. Um, this may also apply to the main residence exemption. There has been a discussion that's been uh, quite a bit written about to do with uh, a, a, a law the government is trying to bring into effect to do with the loss of the main residence exemption. I'm not sure if that's passed or not, or exactly what the status of that is, but in any event, uh, this would mean that the prior rule, the six year rule where you could grandfather the main residence exemption for six years after you moved away, would also go away as of May 9th, 2019. Um, so that is that could really do some, uh, some damage to the hip pocket of, uh, of many Aussie expats who are uh, treating their former primary residence as an investment property. So stay tuned on that one. Here's another thing to be mindful of. Any income, assuming you actually do have a cash flow positive property, in the rare event that that is the case after fully accounting for all the things that we mentioned before, uh, then your income is taxed at the non-resident rate, which is 32.5% and up from the first dollar. In some states, there's also uh, higher property tax rates for absentee owners. So that, that is irrespective of whether the house is rented or not, which brings us to the next point, And that is to do with the ghost house property tax levy. Australia has a real problem with uh, unoccupied residents, mainly because of a, a rule that, as you heard me a moment ago talking about, is, is under consideration and that is with the main residence exemption, you could bring that forward as, as long as uh, was possible or as long as possible uh, if the property remain unoccupied. So uh, that, was, that was a good stopgap measure. Maybe uh, allow a family member to live in the property rent free or simply don't rent it out whatsoever. Uh, well, now you, you, not only may that be going away with uh, the main residence exemption, but also there's uh, ghost house property taxes. So if your property is unoccupied, then in uh, Queensland and Victoria, they're now charging additional property taxes uh, for that as well. Uh, another another uh, item that came into law last year uh, was travel expense deduction for real estate is no longer allowed. So if you intended on deducting that trip you're gonna to take to your property on the Gold Coast or in Cairns, uh, that is no longer allowed. On the US tax side, uh, what do we need to be consider? What do we need to be mindful of here? Well, the double taxation treaty is a treaty between the two sovereign governments of the Australia and United States. It does not take into consideration the individual states of the United States. So, as a U.S. tax resident, which uh, this this presentation is targeted at, uh, you will likely, if you live in a state with income taxes, and most of the expats do, they live in California. Uh, or New York, uh, you you may well be on the hook for income and and likely for capital gains taxes from your individual state unless you're able to sever your domicile with that state, assuming you've moved away. Uh, yet again, that's a topic for our tax attorney friends and CPAs as to how you do that. Now, here is a particularly obscure issue that comes up, and 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 I I kind of think of this as the final nail in the coffin. For, uh, for making the case for uh, US tax residents to be investing in, uh, in Australian real estate. And that is the asymmetric treatment of foreign exchange related gains and losses. What does that mean? That's a fancy word, asymmetric, meaning it's different depending on what side of the, the, the equation you're on. So for, uh, for losses incurred on foreign exchange, there's no deduction. For gains incurred, taxable income. Oh, no, no loss carry forward, but taxable gains on, uh, on, on foreign exchange related uh, gains or losses. Let me illustrate a hypothetical example with very uh, round numbers, unrealistic to be anyone's specific case, but that's not the point, I'm just 
talking about this in order to clearly illustrate what I'm saying. A US tax resident buys an Australian investment property for a million dollars and takes out a 100% uh, it's mortgage finance 100% with an interest only loan. Five years goes by, uh, the investor had hoped for significant capital appreciation, didn't occur. Instead, five years later, the investor decided to sell the property for a million dollars. So they sold it for exactly what they bought it for, so they'd be well and truly out of pocket with all the uh, real estate commissions and the uh, the uh, the stamp duty that, that is, is owing on that property. But that aside, let's talk about what happened with the foreign exchange. So at the time of purchase, there was the exchange rate, what it was, whatever it was. But then at the time that the mortgage was paid off, the Aussie dollar had appreciated by 10% to the US dollar. In that instance, what we have, the way the Internal Revenue Code is written, is we have a foreign currency gain that was never materialized. It was a phantom gain. So while the Aussie dollar is appreciated against the US dollar, and all of this was all of the actual material items of the transaction were happening in Australian dollars. The, all the IRS knows was that at the date of purchase, the, uh, the purchase price converted back to US dollars was X. And at the date of sale, the, purchase, the selling price was converted back to US dollars and it was more taxable income, but not if it went the other way around. That's the point about the asymmetric treatment of foreign exchange related gains and losses. Okay, so the bottom line is this. What is your conviction about the attractiveness of the Australian real estate market as, uh, as an investment asset class? What's your conviction? If you believe that there is strong and sustainable growth, then perhaps uh, you believe that so strongly that it could possibly outweigh all of the handicaps mentioned uh, on the previous two slides. Uh, or you might consider that there, there, uh, there might be other low, lower cost, more liquid, easily diversifiable uh, investments that make sense for a global financial life. Or perhaps here's another uh, scenario where uh, I think it would, it would make a lot of sense to continue to hold on to, to property in Australia as a non-resident. And that would be if you do intend on re possibly returning to your primary residence at some point. In, uh, in the nearest future. So if you go to our website, you'll see previous webinars recorded uh, with other uh, partners on different topics. We're, we're very shortly, we'll have our 2018 key financial data, uh, which will be of interest to uh, Aussie expats, of course, as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, particularly for, for Australian uh, business owners. Very, very important changes uh, afoot with uh, the repatriation tax uh, that's that's due within a, a seven-year time frame. Uh, and also, we've written various white papers. Here's a guide to incentive stock options and, uh, and other topics available. Uh, tomorrow, we'll send out a, uh, a survey. We'd love to hear your feedback on tonight's presentation. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we welcome your emails and comments offline. Thank you very much and uh, I look forward to seeing you again or hearing from you.